This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. We may see momentary changes. We may see momentary effects on the world that the church has, but we are, our mission is not to go and change the world. Our mission is to change individual lives within the world. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word. So glad that you're with us. I'm so glad to be with you. And we're getting some great reports on how people's lives have been changed by the Word of God. And the main thing they're saying is how easy it is to understand the Word of God. And that's what God designed. He never takes the simple and makes it complicated. God takes the complicated and makes it simple. People complicate it. God uncomplicates it and makes it simple. That's our desire. We're starting a two episode lesson today and the next episode is going to be on the subject of God's attitude toward the world. If you really start looking at the world around us, we divide ourselves up so many different ways. We have blacks against whites and women against men and this nationality against this nationality, educated, uneducated, uh, which side of the tracks you're born on. I mean, it all comes down to all the different ways we divide each other. And God only sees one separation in the whole world, and that is Jesus Christ. On this side, you have those that have accepted Him. On this side, you have those that rejected Him. And really in eternity, what difference would it make if you're a man or a woman or old or young or educated, uneducated? All those things don't really matter. The only division God sees in all of mankind is the difference between the two. On this side, you're part of the church. On this side, you're part of the world. And that's what we're going to talk about. What is God's attitude toward the world? Because we seemingly have some uh, confusion in the church about the world. And we're just going to set the record straight from the Word of God so you can have a clear way to see uh, God's word. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12 says this, because iniquity, the, he, the Greek word means lawlessness, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, evil men and seducers will grow worse and worse in the days to come. You know, about the time we think we have a reprieve in our nation, I mean, it just exposes more and more the light of God's word and the light of somebody with just some common sense in government just turns on a light and pretty soon bugs are running everywhere. And we're finding out just how many bugs there are in our own country, and especially around the world. With all the lawlessness, it keeps on increasing and increasing. And people keep talking about, but I thought revival, I thought revival. We're going to talk about what the purpose of revival is. And ultimately, I just want you to know this, revival won't change the entire world. It changes people for a while. It makes people more gravitate toward the Word of God, but never changes the whole world. The one that's going to change the whole world is Jesus Christ Himself when He comes back. Our job is to win souls. And whether that's done through preaching of the Word of God, the supernatural, through our church services, whatever we do, is to transfer people out of the world and into the church to make them come on this side of the cross, accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In the verse of Scripture, we started with in Matthew 24, 12, it says, because iniquity or lawlessness shall abound. And Satan and Antichrist in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 are both called the lawless ones. But also it says in that same verse of scripture that those in the world are called lawless. So we see that really the nature of Satan comes into people themselves. We are born in this earth under the nature of Satan. And Jesus even said of the religious leaders of his day, you're of your father, the devil. And so the fa our father, the devil, really worked through Adam himself. We're not said to be in Satan, although that's pretty true. We're in his family. The Bible says we're in Adam. In Adam all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive. We were born in Adam and had no choice. I mean, you can talk about things in your life and say, well, I, I can't help it. It's just I had no choice in that or, or it was forced on me. Well, here's one you can honestly say was forced on you, and that's the fact you were born in Adam and had no choice. But the thing of it is, is God through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God does give you a choice to be born again. And by being born again, you're not just all automatically born to get into Christ. You die to Adam. You literally leave that family and cease to exist in that family a miracle happens in that this family, as far as you're concerned, is dissolved. But you move over into a new family where you're born again into a new family and this time in Christ. But this was your choice. God doesn't force it on you. And there's so much teaching today that, you know, once Jesus Christ went to the cross, everybody's saved. No, God gives you a choice. 
He reconciled the world to himself. Now you need to be reconciled to him. Accept him as Lord and Savior. So again, Satan and Antichrist are called lawless ones. In essence, it comes down to this. We often pray for the world to change. We look around us, the world doesn't change. So we don't know what's happening. We get confused about it. Your indicator of answered prayers is not the world. Your indicator of answered prayers is the Word of God, your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and the effect that you see on those people around you and the circumstances around you. But as far as praying for the whole world, it's not going to change. In fact, again, the Word of God declares that lawlessness shall abound. That means increase. It also goes on to say that evil workers and iniquity will increase as the days goes. And so it's going to come down to this. Jesus Christ will come back, but it looks like Satan's going to win. He'll be one day away from a victory. And uh, when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to stop the whole thing. And the Bible says if he doesn't come back at that exact time, no, nobody in the world would be saved. We literally would have those things happening. And it would literally be Satan would take over. It's Satan's desire to take over the entire world. And uh, so far he has a leg up on us in that he is the God of this world. But Jesus Christ will come back one day and Satan will no longer be the God of this world. All the nations of the earth are under Satan's authority right now because he took it from Adam. And Adam was given it, then Adam gave it to Satan. And even G Satan tried to give it to Jesus, said, if you'll fall down and worship me. He said, I'll give you all these kingdoms for they were given unto me and to whoever I want, I can give it. So what Satan was saying there to Jesus Christ was the fact that we can, I can give this to you. But there's going to come a day when Jesus Christ will take it legally, not illegally. He won't take it from Satan because Satan gave it to him and Jesus bowed himself down to the devil. No, Jesus Christ stood up to the devil and one day will come back. And when he does, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. And he, Jesus Christ, will rule forever and ever. What we see in our own world around us, again, I say the world is not your indicator of answered prayer. ISIS beheadings have happened and are increasing. Paris, Barcelona, uh, answer, uh, those terrorists that are happening, school murders, movie theaters, street marches, police killings, pulling down of statues, Baltimore, illegal murderers going free. We see these things happening every day and it's increasing. And yet you see people turning to the Lord in churches and stuff and say, well, how can that be? Because I can tell you this, that not only is lawlessness going to increase, but so is the things of God. You're going to see these things rising side by side until ultimately the final battle is going to take place called Armageddon. And Jesus Christ will come back on that day. The church will keep on existing and Satan's kingdom will have stopped on that day. If your focus is on the world around you, the news and all the things that happen in entertainment, there's nothing wrong with watching entertainment. Just don't be moved by it. There's nothing wrong with watching news. Just don't be moved by it. But for every news broadcast you watch, man, read a chapter of the Word of God, study it, because all these things around you can cause you to be discouraged. And even the best news programs slant toward the, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the things around us. They want to be sensational. And God simply saying, no, stick to the Word of God because the Word of God will live and abide forever. And CNN and Fox and all these other things around us, they're not going to last forever, but the Word of God will live and abide forever. And the good news is they may be talking about, oh, this could lead to this and this could lead to that. Read the end of the book because history has told us how it's going to end. And it's going to end with the coming of Jesus Christ. It's going to end with the church being triumphant, Israel being triumphant, and God sending His Son back on that day. The great hope of the church and the great hope of the world is the, the rapture of the church for the church and the second advent of the Lord to bring in the millennial kingdom of the Lord. I come back to this. Our world condition is getting better or worse. We have to admit it's getting worse, but God promised that. God said it was going to happen. God isn't making it happen. Satan is, but there's a border Satan's going to run into one day, and that will be the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is giving nations more and more days to accept Him as Lord and Savior. And every day that Jesus doesn't come back for the church is one more day for us to lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even after that, it'll be seven years before the tribulation comes to an end. And that seven years is not just the fact that God wants to drag this thing on and see people hurt and tortured. No, what God wants is another day for more people to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Do we see pushings of agendas today? The answer is yes. There's agendas behind so many things going on. And the sad thing is so many people don't see it. But as a Christian filled with the Word of God, you can spot it. How about TV sitcoms? Are they getting worse and worse as far as the morals? The answer is yes. How about language in movies? My Lord, yes. Yes, there was a time when they threw in a bad word 
and everybody was shocked at it. Today, there's so much of it in there that you don't even get shocked at it anymore. Is there a moral decline in our country? The answer is yes. Is there a homosexual agenda, such as homosexual marriage? The answer is yes. Do we see the left and the right fighting more and more than ever before? The answer is yes. But understand that the Lord said that these things would come to pass and that iniquity would abound and lawlessness would abound and also that evil men and seducers will continue to wax and become worse and worse until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Matthew 24 verse 38 declares that the world is headed toward the days of Noah. Thank God there's going to become a rescue at the end of that time period. But as the days were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage and knew not until the flood came and took them away. This is what's happening with the world. Sinners are sinning more and more. Sin is increasing. And one day they're going to be swept away by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 24, 22, I already quoted it, but here it is again. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. Are church situations getting better or worse? Well, overall, the church is getting weaker. Now, there are pockets of revival. And I really sense in myself that in the United States, as well as around the world, it's happening right now, revival will take place. It seems like in the past, we've had revival in the United States that spread around the world. Now we're seeing revival all around the world. And next to all, it's headed toward the United States. But in revival, we look around us. But what's happening in churches is we need a revival. There's pastors everywhere questioning the infallibility of the Word of God calling it just myths and fables, as was declared in 2 Peter chapter 1 would happen. We have no room for the Holy Spirit, as well as no room for the teaching of the Word of God. Everybody says, well, you know, it's divisive. Well, no, it's uniting when it's preached correctly and the Holy Spirit's allowed to operate. We see universalism, or also called inclusion, where people are saying, well, people are already saved. We don't know need to take the world, because how can a loving God cast people into hell? It's because He's not only a loving God, He's a righteous God, and righteousness is to protect those that are born again. Next of all, we see the acceptance of all the homosexual agenda, but also just the agendas uh, immorally around the world are just being accepted. and or even today ordaining homosexual ministers. And many ministers that are out there aren't even born again. But we see this thing declining so rapidly around us internally and externally within the church and also within the world. There were two views of Dwight L. Moody, and that was that in his day. And uh, when we come back after the break, we're going to talk about that. But it's the same two views we have today in the church. There's two views toward the world and uh, how the church is going to win those that need to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And just as in Dwight L. Moody's day, he had the answer so the answer is still today because the Word of God itself lives and abides forever and our answers have not changed because our problems have not changed. So we will see you as soon as we come back from the break. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership or call us at 918-250-2207. The world around us is in a free fall today. Uh, There was a time it looked like that pretty much we had things in control, even though things were slipping all around us. But all of a sudden, it seems like in the past probably 10, 15 years, this nation's been pushed off the precipice and we're in a free fall. And it seems to be accelerating. And uh, more and more we see it in the church. There's a free fall in the church. And we ask where are we headed to? There's a free fall in the world. Where are we headed to? I can tell you this according to the Word of God. Jesus Christ isn't going to come back for the church in the midst of a time of great confusion in the church or just wrong doctrines. I believe He's going to come back in a time of great revival because where sin abounds, that's the world. Grace does much more abound. That's got to be the church. And even though the message of grace has been perverted today, it's the message of the hour. It's exactly what we needed. And it's what's causing many people to eventually become swept into the kingdom of God. Back in the days of Dwight L. Moody, there were two views of the world. In fact, Dwight L. Moody had a man that ministered with him, his right-hand man, and they ministered and did meetings together. And then they separated for a while, but they would cross paths and minister together until one day Dwight L. Moody said, that's it, I'm not going to minister with him again. When questioned about it by Christian magazines and Christian newsletters and things like that, when 
question about it. Dwight L. Moody said this. He said, we have two different viewpoints of the world. He said, they've actually come into collision with each other and I can no longer agree to even be on the platform with him. He said, many errors I can, I can get along with. He said, I can go along with because they're not those that vastly affect huge numbers of people. He said, but this one does. He said, my friend says, that the world is a giant ship. It's headed from this shore to this shore, and that giant ship is, is filled with believers and unbelievers. By the time we get to the other shore, we will have won all of the unbelievers on that ship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Dwight L. Moody said that is absolutely not true. He said the world is a ship, but it's a sinking ship. He said, much like the Titanic, there's a band on there playing as the thing goes down. People are ignoring what's going on. He said that the church is another ship which pulled up next to it. We've pulled alongside of that ship called the world. And he said, our job is to get them to jump off that ship into our ship because our ship won't go down. The world has a day when it's going to go down. The The ship called the church will never go down because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Israel is eternal. The church is eternal. And uh, the church, again, are those that are saved out of the world. And the church is a rescue ship. And in essence, we come back to this. There are two definitions of the church and two definitions of the world. And we must understand that. The two definitions of the church, the Greek word for church is ekklesia. And it means the called out ones. Even what I have just said, we have called out people from the world into the church. And so there's two definitions of the church. One is the universal church, and the second one is the local church. And the universal church is made up of local churches. Local churches are the one within the other. The one that's inside is the local church inside of the universal church. Because once you get born again, you become part of the universal church. It's God's desire for you to become part of a local church. The universal church and the local church, again, come back to that word called out. The universal church are those called out of Satan's family into God's family. And then the local church are those that are called out of the world system into a different system. And that is the local church. The local church is as close to heaven as possible. You say, what do you mean by that? There's plenty of problems in the local church. There is none in heaven, but it is one step closer from the world into heaven itself. That's why we meet together. That's why Christians come together. The church is called the assembly of the upright throughout the Old Testament. The assemblies of the believers, the assemblies of the brothers. All these different things are indicators that the main ones who come to church are Christians so that we can be sheltered from the world for an hour, an hour and a half, two or three times a week, and we can get filled with the Word of God and go back out and face the world. Do we get people saved in church? Of course we do, but that's not the main place people are one. The main place people are one are in the world. Jesus didn't say go into all the churches and preach the gospel. He said go into all the world and preach the gospel. But yes, we find it that people do come to church. In fact, go into the highways, hedges, compel them to come to my house that it may be full is a thing that we are supposed to do. But the bulk of evangelism, 99% of evangelism does not happen in the church. The purpose of the church is perfecting saints to go out and do the work of the ministry, which is leading people to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the universal church and we have the local church. The church is always a portion of the population, not the entire population. And so churches today are trying to change the intellectual currents of this age. And they're trying to uh, change the social and economic order in order to build a new civilization for our children. That is exactly wrong. We cannot change the world. The world is headed on a collision course. The world is headed downhill. What we do is quit trying to change the world and introduce the believers to or unbelievers to a brand new world called the church. We call them out of this family into this family, out of Satan's family into God's family. We talk them, uh, get them to go leave Adam and get in Christ or change from this world system to a new system called the church, which will be connected one day to heaven itself and eternity with God. So this is our purpose. Again, we cannot change the world. I'm going to say that again. Churches today are trying to change the intellectual currents of this age, change the social and economic order, and build a new civilization for our children. We will never build a better civilization for our children. We are to build better children for the civilization we live in. And the more we raise them on the nurture and admonition of the Lord, we don't need to fear what the world is. I've had people tell me just getting married, we're not sure we want to have children because we don't want to bring children into this evil world. You're acting like the world is greater than your children. Never is there a time when the world will be greater than the church 
or greater than believers. And God's word is always more powerful than Satan's word. The new birth is always more powerful than the birth of those who are around us who have been born again once or been born once. We've been born again and now we have been born twice. So we in essence have the word of God and we have the greater power. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So again, we will never build a better world for our children, but we must build better children for the world. And Jesus will build a better world at the second advent. Leave the better world up to the Lord Jesus Christ that will handle it and leave the gospel in our hands. Jesus isn't going to preach the word and we're not going to change the world. We're going to preach the world. Jesus will change the world one of these days. We preach the word of God to them. There's also two definitions of the world. The word for world is cosmos. And uh, what it means is the system of the world or the world's order around us. When we use the word world, we're not talking about the planet. That's a different Greek word. That's the word gay, G-E. We get geology and geography from that word. It's talking about the physical planet itself. But there's a world system, a world order. You go to different nations, you can sense it. From You can go from socialism to those under heavy capitalism. You can go to those that were under communism before. I mean, all these different places around the world, you can sense it. When you go into cities, you can sense something about that city. I've had people tell me they went up to one city, they could just sense the difference in the air of just, not just demonic, but just a fact of non-caring toward the gospel. They go to other cities and they say there's just such a hunger for the word of God. Well, the world system, cosmos, that's what it's talking about. And that is the system behind what we see. Much like when you turn on the TV to a certain station, you can feel an agenda coming through. That's the world system. And this is what, the, again, the word cosmos means. And again, just like in the church, there's two worlds, one within the other. There is the local church within the universal church. In the world, we have two definitions. The first definition for the world, again, is the world system. But the second definition is the people of the world. The people of the world are within the larger system. And so this is what we're talking about here when we talk about that the world around us. The world is a way of thinking. It's a mindset totally opposed to the thinking of God and his word. This is why we need our minds renewed by the word of God to withstand the world's way of thinking. And that's why it's said that they have the mind of the world, but we have the mind of Christ. And so it's a different way of thinking. In fact, it's such a radical thing that we find the more we start thinking like the word of God, becoming a true disciple, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciple. The whole essence of the Christian life is the renewing of the mind. So when the world's going this way, we end up going that way. And so the mindset of the world is in opposition. James chapter four and verse four, don't you know that friendship with the world is the enemy of God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes themselves an enemy of God. There's the first world we talked about. The first world is the world system. That is our enemy. We can never become friends with the world system, but we can become friendly with the world, the people of the world. You see, although that verse says that God hates the world and that's the world system, we also find in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What's he talking about? God doesn't like the world system, but Jesus died for the people in in the world. Jesus didn't die for the world system to change. He personally is going to have to come back and do that outside of the cross. He will do it at the battle of Armageddon. But he has sent to us and told us the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ where we can be transferred out of the world. And what he has done is we are not to try to change the world but pull our ship next up to the world and ask the people of the world to jump over onto our ship. And salvation comes one person at a time. And this is why again Satan so hates the gospel and hates the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus didn't die for the world system. He died for the people of the world. And the world system will never be redeemed. It has to be destroyed. And that's because Jesus Christ will come back. We ask you a question, who controls the world? Well, we're told in 1 John 5, 19. In fact, you can turn there and read if you want with me. 1 John 5, 19 says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We cannot expect moral change in the world because Satan is the God of this world and Satan is the ruler of this world and it's under the sway of the wicked one. This age as all ages before until Jesus returns are under Satan's control and is set against God. Like Satan, the world cannot be redeemed. Like Satan, the world will always hate the church. It is as useless to pray for the world as it is to pray for Satan to be changed. I actually was in a church one time. A little girl was crying and 
the mother said, can you answer her question? And she said, what she's crying about is the fact she feels burdened for the devil and she wants the devil to be saved. And so she's just wondering why nobody will, will pray with her. Or I said, it can't happen. The Bible tells us God's going to give him as much opportunity to change as possible. And even after a thousand years of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on this earth, Satan being cast into hell, watching this whole thing go on, when he gets out after a thousand years, he still tries to find, uh, he still forms a rebellion against God. It it comes back to this, Satan never will change. It's useless to pray for the devil to change, but since the world is under his control, it's useless to pray for the world to change. We may see momentary changes. We may see momentary effects on the world that the church has, but we, our mission is not to go and change the world. Our mission is to change individual lives within the world, and that is to get people to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In essence, Satan and the world are un changeable. There is no future for them of improvement. Again, as I said, they cannot be changed. They can only be destroyed. And Satan, Antichrist, the entire kingdom, the whole system he has will one day be destroyed, as will the world system. And on that day, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. Next time we come back, we're going to talk about our commission to the world, the Great Commission, and what that Great Commission is. We'll see you next time. The Bible says we are in the world, but not of the world. But what is God's attitude toward the world? Should we pray for the world to change? As Christians, our job is not to save the world. Our job is to win souls, to transfer people out of the world and into the church. In this three-lesson series titled, The World, Bob Yandian defines what the world system is and what the role of the church is today. The World Series includes all three parts of this broadcast on CD and DVD. This series is available for $25 plus shipping and handling. To order, visit bobyandian.com and click on TV Offers or call 918-250-2207. Paul saw that the gospel was a team effort. Teaching the word of God was a team effort. In fact, everything he did, he gave credit to the Lord Jesus Christ and also to his team. You know, I do the same thing. I thank God for my givers. I pray for you each day. You have, who have given into this ministry, those who are partners with me in this ministry, I pray for you because without you, this team would not exist. God hardly ever uses just individuals. He finally pulls people together as a team. This has always been his plan. Many of you have been with me, just like Paul said from the very beginning. Others have joined me through the years. I'd love for you to join me if you're not a partner and become a partner, become a team member as I travel and teach. Go to bobyandian.com and join hands with me today. For those who have yet to hear the teaching of the Word of God and for those who want to become a part of that new generation of ministers. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact or call us at 918-250-2207. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.